Forrest is our uh, university chair of plastic surgery. I wouldn't be surprised oh. if he reaches out to you oh. afterwards uh, because oh, he's great. interested in history. And of course, he's the, the lead in plastics uh, in our yeah. university. Oh, and we, we bought, I think we told you, we bought uh, a number, like 100 plus books to distribute oh, to the cool. faculty members and you sent your book plates over, which is great, yeah. so. Foist oh. the book on them, <laughs> these poor people. <laughs> yeah. They don't have enough troubles in this world. Now they have to, you know, get this book, but no, no it's, it's, it's always a, wonderful to talk to medical audiences, especially about, about this. Uh, yeah, I, I would think so. Um, yeah. You know, we're all trying to imagine what it would be like to operate in the days of Lister. It must have been a horror show. Like yeah. it must have been terrible. The carnage, incredible. Yeah. And uh, just. I'm, I'm very, I'm trying to, to get this made into a movie. And oh, I, I, I joke that I'm going into Hollywood trying to convince them that this Quaker surgeon that nobody's heard about needs this movie. But it, it was an incredible time. And when you think yeah. about what Lister had to overcome. Yeah, so I see, Lindsay, we're doing great. We have like over a hundred folks already joined the line, nice. Um, we'll just wait a couple more minutes and then we'll, we'll get going. Yeah, I don't know if uh, folks on the exec have had a chance to read. Avery, have you read the book or seen it yet? Uh, it's coming your way if you haven't got it yet. I have it, but I have not had a chance to read it yet. I just got it Monday. Okay, great, good. Whether you like it or not, it's coming your way, so. <laughs> Um, it's it's funny too because I, I just finished the movie script for for the adaptation um, and I, I have that in with several studios at the moment to convince them that this is this is needs to be a movie but um, having spent a lot of time with plastic surgery in World War One I, I have to kind of remind myself and go back to the 19th century and go back to Lister's period yeah. jumping over the place at the moment. Yeah, so Terry, just wait another couple of minutes and then we'll, uh, we'll begin. Yeah, so Lindsay, uh, is your husband uh, I, from UK or American? Um, he's British. Yeah, British. He's, um, in fact, he's a cartoonist and he worked on Spitting Image. So if there's anybody out there who knows that old British show that was uh, popular in the 80s and 90s, they've revived it and they create <laughs> caricatured puppets of politicians oh. and you know kind of tis the season right now with all of the yeah. crazy politics going on in the world so yeah and you've been in the uk more than a decade now you said 15 years oh yeah, yeah. well yeah a long time but a short break to live in toronto in yeah toronto, so that was great yeah no fascinating yeah no we really hoped that we could host you here in toronto oh, for... I, it would have been so great i know hopefully another time maybe yeah another. Because I think I first wrote to you in the spring last year, and we all thought, oh, the pandemic is going to be over, and uh, for sure yeah. we're going to be able to meet in person. But yeah, I'm not even and sure so what's going to look like a year from now. Yeah. As a medical historian, I, I know that we go through this denial stage, but you know, early on, I was like, this isn't going to turn into anything. Yeah. And then, oh, you know, it's just shut the world down. Yeah, well, maybe when this all blows over, we can get you back to Toronto and you can visit your old haunts and uh, we can show you the Department of Surgery, which uh, actually has uh, quite a, a footprint of Lister's works in it, uh, including an image of um, Lister that I'll show during my presentation and I'll, I'll turn it over to you. So Terry, how are we doing there? What uh, time do you have? It's just three, three minutes past 7.30, so... Okay, I'll just give another minute and then we'll get going. I see 150 folks on the line, that's nice. So as I often say, Lindsay, a big name draws a big crowd. So that's good. Bright and early for this, this uh, <laughs> yeah. horrific talk on a 19th century surgery and yeah. transporting you guys all to the past here. There's 282 registered. So okay. maybe a couple of minutes will be- Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, that sounds good. So is there um, panels all day today? Is it one after the other? Yeah, thanks. Uh, no, uh, today, this is a, a named lecture after one of our uh, former department chairs. And uh, every month of the year, we have um, a lecture that's hosted by the Department of Surgery. It's usually the first Friday of every month. Oh, and um, I thought next it was a conference. I thought they had to, there was other speeches today. 
Yeah, later in the year, we have something called uh, Galley Day, which is like that, a, a research conference that Michael Phalanx, who's on the line, hosts uh, for us. And that goes all day long, and it's a departmental uh, event. And uh, we listen to the research presentations and have invited speakers and so on. And this is actually, this may be interesting for you. This is the 100th year anniversary of the discovery of insulin. And uh, it was discovered in Toronto by a surgeon named Frederick Banting. And um, so Toronto likes to lay claim to that. Yeah. Um, the Department of Physiology lays big claim to it. Um, we, as uh, Department of Surgery, like to um, underscore the fact that Banting was a surgeon. And so we have right. to remember. Yeah, if you want to claim that. Yeah. Um, I think there's a there's a, a popular commercial book on this subject. You probably know of it. I can't recall the name, but um, I think there was a, a book about this discovery in insulin. It, it was, you know, out there in the commercial world. I'll have to dig up the title and maybe you can reach out to the author because maybe that. Yeah, be yeah. No, I mean, there is a lot of subterfuge behind the discovery of insulin. And uh, Michael Bliss, a fa famous uh, medical historian from the University of Toronto, wrote one of the definitive works on uh, banting and the discovery of insulin um, but there's been a lot written on this uh, subject for sure and uh, but it's uh, an opportunity for us to celebrate and I mean it's a huge discovery and um, and Toronto was placed on the map by virtue of uh, banting and best's uh, discovery of insulin. Wow that's amazing. Okay Terry I think we'll get going so um, uh, welcome and good morning everyone and uh, welcome to the annual Kurgan lectureship it uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris uh, this morning to you. But just before I do, I want to say a few words about uh, Dr. Kurgan, uh, former chair of the Department of Surgery, a graduate from U of T uh, Medical School in 1930. He was a Rhodes Scholar and studied in Oxford, which is where uh, Dr. Fitzharris, our speaker today, uh, did her uh, graduate studies. Uh, chair, uh, 1957 to 1966 in surgery, Associate Dean of Clinical Affairs in 1966. One of his big accomplishments was integrating all the residency programs at all the affiliate hospitals. Prior to his time, that hadn't been done uh, before effectively. He became chair of the editorial board of the Canadian Journal of Surgery and president of the American Association of Thoracic Surgery, a, a huge uh, position to hold. And I'm delighted to say that Shaf Kashavji, who's on the executive committee, who's uh, uh, that you're seeing today, Lindsay uh, Schaff is the current president of that organization. And uh, Kurgan des designed and discovered a number of um, um, innovative procedures like the Kurgan thoracoplasty and uh, bronchoplasty. Uh, these are the names of some of the previous award winners for uh, the Kurgan lecture, uh, such notables as former chairs of the department that you can see here, uh, members of parliament. Uh, we've also had authors, uh, Gerald Imber, we've had the skeptical scalpel speak to us, uh, former university presidents and the like. So it's been, a, it's been a, an excellent um, lecture series for us. Just a few words about uh, Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris. Um, she's a best-selling author, television host, medical historian, and she wrote this book that has uh, been distributed to many of you. You've received it, The Butchering Art, which won the Wilson Award for Literary oh. Science and it's been translated into numerous uh, languages. Uh, she writes regularly for publications, including the Wall Street Journal, Scientific American, uh, The uh, Guardian, Lancet, New Scientist, and she has a new television series on the Smithsonian Channel, The Curious Life and Death of, and explores some of the most mysterious deaths in history. Uh, her next book will be on the birth of plastic surgery and uh, told through the story of Harold Gillies, pioneering surgeon who first united art and medicine to address uh, horrific uh, facial injuries. I mentioned to Lindsay that Dr. Chris Forrest is a chair of uh, plastic surgeon. He'd be very interested among his colleagues in this uh, book. So uh, Lister plays a big role in the department. You can see my backdrop <laughs> and then on just over my shoulder is this uh, portrait of uh, Lister uh, that was given to us um, by Irving Cameron uh, in the 1920s, I believe. Uh, but uh, we also have a brick that was given to the <laughs> Department of Surgery from the Royal Infirmary in Glasgow. And um, what you're seeing next to the portrait of Lister here is a bronze sculpture where an impression of that brick that was in the Banting Institute, um, uh, which is now being torn down, uh, was uh, saved. And uh, Dr. Ogilvy, Daryl Ogilvy Harris, uh, managed to create this bronze replica of the brick that is now kept 
within the Department of Surgery next to the portrait of Lister. So we actually have quite a, a fondness for and, uh, and, and a tremendous regard for Joseph Lister and all that he did in the era uh, leading up to the era of antisepsis. So uh, with that, I'll turn the program over to our invited Kurgan lecturer, Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris. Uh, Lindsay, we look forward to your lecture and thank you very much for being with us today. Yeah, thank you so much for those kind words. Let me just get my my slides up here. This is the first time I've ever done a lecture by Zoom, so just bear with me if there's any technical blips along the way. Let me see here. So I hope that everybody can see this now. So firstly, I just want to say what an honor it is to be here today. Um, I was hoping that I could go to Toronto and be with you in person, but it's miraculous that this technology allows us to be together while also being apart and uh, staying safe. Now, during uh, before the pandemic, I spent a huge amount of time traveling the world, demolishing any lingering romantic notions people might have had about what it was like to live in the past. So forget everything Hollywood's told you, because we are so lucky to live in the 21st century, lucky not to have to endure the horrors of pre-anesthetic and pre-antiseptic operations, like poor 12-year-old Henry Pace, who was told in 1828 that he was going to have to have his leg removed without any anesthetic. When he was told this, he asked the surgeon whether it would hurt, and the surgeon replied, no more than having a tooth pulled. Poor Henry Pace, he was brought into the operating theater, he was blindfolded and restrained, and he was so awake, so aware, that he remembers counting six strokes of the saw before his little leg fell off into the hands of the surgeon. We are so lucky to live in the 21st century, despite the current circumstances, because we don't have to endure operations like Stephen Pollard did. In 1824, he had to have a bladder stone removed. Now, if you don't know how this was done in the 19th century, don't worry, I'm not gonna go into too much detail. It's a little bit early, although I suspect that this medical audience would be less traumatized as a general audience when I share these details. But needless to say, you can tell two really important things from this slide. Number one, it hurt. It hurts today, it hurt even more in the past when they couldn't manage pain. And number two, it was really, really stressful and slightly embarrassing for the patient because imagine being brought into an operating theater filled to the rafters with ticketed spectators because people actually bought tickets to see the life and death struggle play out before them. And that's exactly what happened to Stephen Pollard in 1824. Now, what should have taken five minutes ended up taking over an hour as he struggled against the knife and he cried out for the surgeon to please, dear God, stop. And the surgeon yelled back at him for having, quote, abnormal anatomy. So if you can imagine this horrific operation in front of all of these strangers, it's going terribly and you, the patient, is being blamed for this. Now, Stephen Pollard pulled through that operation only to die 24 hours later of post-operative infection, something I'm going to be talking about a lot in this lecture, um, and something that certainly plagued these doctors and the surgeons in the 19th century. And it was revealed on his autopsy report that, in fact, he did not have abnormal anatomy. It was the surgeon's fault. And let us not forget Lucy Thurston, who in the 1840s had to have a mastectomy without any anesthetic. Now, at this time, hospitals were very much places for the poor. If you were wealthy or if you were middle class like Lucy Thurston, you had your operation in your own home, sometimes on your own dining room table. Um, and this was a lot safer. It was a more controlled environment because as you're going to see, these hospitals were pest houses and infection rates were so high. Now, the surgeon determined that the breast was going to have to come off, and he told her that he would return, but he wasn't going to tell her the day he would return because he didn't want her to fixate on the day. Now, I don't know about you, but that would make me a lot more <laughs> anxious not knowing when this guy was going to show up at my house again. Well, he does show up at her house. He walks through the front door, up the stairs, into her bedroom. He opens his hand and he shows her the knife he's going to use, and he tells her to prepare her soul for death. This isn't very confidence inspiring when you tell your patient to prepare their soul for death. Prepare she did, but she could not prepare for the pain. Now, one of the challenges that I face as a historian when I'm dealing with the 19th century is that I often don't have a sense of the patient's experience. Um, I have a lot of records from the surgeons and from the physicians, but not always the patients themselves. Remember, these hospitals are for the poor, um, so they were likely illiterate, or if they were leaving behind written records, they've since been lost. Now, Lucy Thurston did pull through that operation, and she actually went on to live a pretty long and healthy life, 
And she wrote to her daughter shortly after. And there's nothing I can share with you today that's more powerful than her words. So I just want to read you this letter briefly. She said, then came a gash, long and deep, first on one side of my breast, then on the other. Deep sickness seized me and deprived me of my breakfast. This was followed by extreme faintness. My sufferings were no longer local. There was a general feeling of agony throughout the whole system. I felt every inch of me as though my flesh was failing. I myself fully intended to have seen the thing done, but on recollection, every glimpse I happened to have was of the doctor's right hand covered with blood up to the very wrist. He afterwards told me that at one time blood from an artery flew into his eyes so he couldn't see. It was nearly an hour and a half, she writes, an hour and a half that I was beneath his hand. We are very lucky to live in the 21st century despite the current circumstances and we owe a huge debt to the doctors and the surgeons who came before us and an even bigger debt to the patients who endured these operations and through the use of their bodies taught us so much about medicine. So my book, The Butchering Art, came out in 2017, which I, I can't believe it's been so long. Um, and I have been very uh, privileged to have so much interest in this. And it's been my honor to also tell this story. But it came out in 2017. And I started a worldwide tour in Philadelphia at that point. And I was really excited to start in Philadelphia. Because my book is about this man, as we've established, a British surgeon named Joseph Lister. Um, who to medical audiences is very well known, but not necessarily to the general public. Today, he is known as the father of antiseptic surgery. He took Louis Pasteur's germ theory and he applied it to medical practice through the development of antisepsis. And of course, he saved thousands of lives in his own time. And he continues to save people's lives today because we operate within this paradigm where we understand that germs exist. I like to call the butchering art a love story between science and medicine because it is the first time that a scientific principle is applied to medical practice. And I was really excited to start in Philadelphia in 2017 because it happened to be 135 years ago to the very day that Lister himself had gone to Philadelphia. He went there to convince American surgeons of the existence of germs and of the desperate need to adopt antiseptic principles. And a few fun things happened as a result of his trip to Philadelphia. So if there is anyone, and this is probably pretty doubtful with this audience, but if there's anyone who doesn't really know who Lister is, but the name sounds kind of familiar, it's probably because of this product, Listerine. So there was a man in the audience in Philadelphia, and he was inspired by Lister's talk of germs and of antisepsis, and he decided to create this product, Listerine. It was named for Lister, but not by him. He had nothing to do with it. And in fact, it wasn't even used in the 19th century as a mouthwash. It was used more commonly to treat gonorrhea. Um, something I'm pretty sure the Listerine company isn't too pleased I'm going around the world talking about. And something I don't endorse, by the way, don't just throw a little Listerine on it. Um, but that was one of the products that sort of came out of, of Lister visiting America. And when I go around talking to audiences, when I say Listerine, those things kind of click. There was another man in the audience that day when Lister was speaking, and he too was inspired by this talk of germs and antisepsis. And so he, his name was Robert Wood Johnson, and he got together with his brother to create the first ever American company to produce antiseptic surgical dressings. That company today is known as Johnson & Johnson. So here you have this pamphlet from the early 20th century. Um, these are amazing to look at. If you ever come across one in an antique uh, store, definitely pick it up. It's sort of like an idiot's guide on how to operate on your own kitchen table. And it's all perfectly safe as long as you're using Johnson & Johnson's antiseptic surgical dressings. So all of these things happened as a result of Lister uh, traveling to America. And I was really excited to be following his footsteps. Today, I'm a freelance writer. One of my jobs is to sell books. But I actually feel really passionately that the name Joseph Lister should be better known. I think his work is as important as Sir Isaac Newton or Charles Darwin. Um, and so my, my whole journey has been to try to convince people that they need to understand the impact he's had on, that, on this world. But in order to convince you of his influence, I really need to take you back to the early 19th century, to these early Victorian hospitals before Joseph Lister walks onto the scene. Now, the best that could be said about these early Victorian hospitals is that they were a slight improvement over their 18th century predecessors. 
which wasn't really saying much when you consider that in the 18th century, the bug catcher was paid more than the doctors and the surgeons. So this delightful trade card from the Welcome Collection here in London, um, I'm coming to you from the UK. If there's any aspiring medical historians out there, the Henry Welcome Collection started in the 19th century, um, now attached to the GlaxoSmith Pharmaceuticals is a fantastic medical history collection. Um, this is for a man named Andrew Cook. And in the 18th century, he called himself the bug destroyer, which I absolutely love. And he claims at the time that he made this card that he had rid 20,000 beds of bugs and lice in these hospitals. Now, when you consider there was that much bugs and lice crawling around in the hospitals, you can understand why Andrew Cook was paid so well. And it wasn't just that. In 1825, visitors to St. Thomas's Hospital in London saw maggots and mushrooms growing in the damp soiled sheets of a patient with a compound fracture. And what was so crazy about that situation was that the patient hadn't even thought to complain about it. These were the conditions that they had come to expect and certainly the surgeons and the doctors themselves had gotten used to these conditions as well. So now that I've hopefully convinced you that if you have magically transported to the early 19th century, you absolutely would not wanna end up in one of these places it might come as a surprise to you that they were actually really difficult to gain entry into. You needed this. This is a hospital ticket from 1836. Um, they're really hard to come by now because of course you would use your hospital ticket, you would discard it. Um, and again, you know these, these would have been in the hands of poor people so they wouldn't have necessarily held on to it. But this is a great example from 1836, an admission ticket for the Belfast line in hospital. Now, in order to get a hospital ticket, you had to petition a hospital governor or somebody on the hospital board. These people had no medical training. They were political positions. And it could take weeks or sometimes longer before you got your hospital ticket. And when I said at the beginning of this lecture that hospitals were for the poor, they were actually for what historians label um, the deserving poor at this time. They were called the deserving poor. That meant that you still had to have some level of income to cover some of your costs for your food, for instance. Um, and some hospitals charged you extra if they deemed you to be particularly foul. I don't know how they determined that. Of course, in the 21st century, everybody in the early 19th century would seem particularly foul to us. But they did charge people extra if they deemed you to be particularly foul. Uh, other hospitals charged you uh, to prepay for your burial because it was so expected you were going to die in these places. If you were absolutely destitute in Victorian England, you had virtually no medical options. Not that you would necessarily want to end up in these places anyway. But as a result of these hospitals um, being so dingy and there's no concept of sterilization, there's a term that's coined, it's called hospitalism. And this really refers to the idea that you were more likely to die as a result of entering these places than not. And surgeons were particularly concerned about four major infections, which, which were erysepelas, septicemia, pyemia, and hospital gangrene. Now, I usually pause here. I don't have to remind this audience that, of course, patients still contract these kinds of infections today. People still, unfortunately, die from it. But the difference is that because we understand germ theory and we understand how these infections are spread, we're better able to proactively prevent it and, of course, better able to treat and manage it when it does occur. If you are in the early 19th century and you have no concept of germ theory or cleanliness or sterilization, this is a very dangerous situation indeed. And these infections spread like wildfire around these hospitals. They just essentially become pest houses. The surgeon John Bell wrote about the cries of the sufferers are the same in the night as in the daytime. They are exhausted in the course of a week and die, or if they survive and the ulcers erode, and eat down and disjoin the muscles, the great vessels are at, le at last exposed and eroded and they bleed to death. So this was a situation that many patients were experiencing in these early 19th century hospitals and how awful would it have been as well for the surgeons working in these conditions. In fact, so horrific were these hospitals 
that it was seriously suggested that the only way to control the situation was to burn them down from time to time and start anew. And I think this is such an evocative image and really shows the desperation that these doctors felt that they would consider burning a hospital down in a major city and just rebuilding it every few years. Um, so, so these places were, were dingy and awful and they were certainly houses of death um, as they were referred to. So at this point um, in the talk, I'd like to pause and do a reading uh, from the butchering art. I do that for a couple of reasons. Number one, if you haven't read the book yet, it gives you a little bit of sense of my style. I am a medical historian. I have a PhD from Oxford, but I'm very much a storyteller these days. And I like to connect with audiences. I don't want people to feel like they have to have a PhD in the subject. Um, and, and I like to bring people into what it was like to live in the past. The section I want to share with you is one that I love to share with medical audiences because it's the first time that Joseph Lister as a medical student enters the dead house or what we would call the cadaver lab. Now, I spoke at Purdue a few years ago, Purdue University, and I had the privilege of getting a tour of the cadaver lab. That was the first time that I had ever been in one. And um, it, it very much, you know, looked and smelled how I sort of imagined it. We, you know, the, the general public, people like me who have no business being in there, we know what it looks like because it's shown on TV to some extent. The smell was very powerful. But um, I want you to hold that image in your head about what that was like for you as a medical student, because I guarantee it was very different for Joseph Lister. We're talking about the 18, late 1840s. And there was no way to preserve the bodies. So these bodies were in sometimes semi or even advanced states of decomposition. They also didn't wear any protective gear. So this could be a very dangerous activity indeed. And also the other thing that I like to emphasize before I do the reading is that going into medicine was a very serious decision. Not that it isn't today. And of course, now we have doctors exposing themselves to COVID-19. So in a way, it's similar to Lister's time because this is before mass vaccinations and it's certainly before antibiotics. So a lot of these students who go into the profession, they die as a result. Um, so it was, it was a really serious de decision and you had to really believe in what you were doing uh, before you took the weight of the world on you and, and uh, became a medical student. So I'm going to just do this short reading. It's about five minutes long and then I'll get back to talking about what would happen uh, once you made it through medical school in this early Victorian period. A halo of light from a gas lamp illuminated the corpse lying on the table at the back of the room. The body had already been mutilated beyond recognition, its abdomen hacked away by the knives of eager students who afterwards carelessly tossed the decomposing organs back into the gory cavity. The top of the cadaver's skull had been removed and was now sitting on a stool next to its deceased owner. Early in Lister's medical studies, he came face to face with a similar scene at University College London. A central walkway split the dingy dissection room in half with five wooden tables on either side. Cadavers were left with their incised heads hanging over the edges, which caused blood to gather in congealed puddles below. A thick layer of sawdust covered the floor, making the dead house disconcertingly quiet to those who entered it. Quote, not a sound could be heard even of my own feet. There was only that dull and rolling sound of the traffic in the streets, which is peculiar to London, and which came dismally down through the ventilators in the roof, one's fellow student observed. Although University College London and its hospital were still relatively new in 1847, its dissection room was just as grim as those found in older institutions. It harbored all kinds of horrible sights, sounds, and smells. When Lister sliced into the abdomen of cadaver, he released a powerful mixture of fetid smells that would cleave to the inside of nostrils for a considerable time after one had quit the scene. To make matters worse, there was an open fireplace at the end of the room, making it unbearably stuffy in the winter months when anatomy lessons commenced, because of course anatomy was a winter sport at that time. Unlike today, students could not escape the dead during their studies and often lived side by side with the bodies that they dissected. Even those who did not live immediately adjacent to an anatomy school carried with them reminders of their gruesome activities because neither gloves nor other forms of protective gear were worn. The cadaver tested the, the courage and composure of anyone who dared set foot inside. Even the most seasoned dissectors could find themselves in pulse quickening situations from time to time. The surgeon James Marion Sims recalled a terrifying incident from his student days. 
His instructor was performing a dissection by candlelight one evening when he accidentally knocked loose a chain that was wrapped around the corpse and anchored to the ceiling. The cadaver, pulled by the weight of its own limbs, jerked to the floor in the upright posture with its arms forcibly thrown over the dissector's shoulders. Just then, the candle, which had been resting on the dead man's chest, sputtered out, leaving the room in total darkness. So it might have been a little bit different uh, to how you guys experienced it in medical school. For the uninitiated, the dissection room was a waking nightmare. The French composer and former st medical student Hector Berlioz jumped out of the window and ran home, later recalling that it was, quote, as though death himself and all his grisly band were hot on my heels. He described an overwhelming feeling of revulsion at the sight of the, quote, limbs scattered about, the head smirking, the skulls gaping, the bloody cesspool under put, underfoot, and the repulsive stench of the place. And I just want to um, reiterate there that those are his words, not mine. One of the worst sights, he thought, was of the rats nibbling on the bleeding vertebrae and the swarms of sparrows pecking at the leftover scraps of spongy uh, lung tissue. The profession clearly was not for everyone. But for those wishing to continue with their degrees, there was no avoiding it. Far from viewing it as repulsive, most students ultimately embraced the opportunity to carve up the dead when the time came to commence their anatomical lessons, and Joseph Lister was no exception. Little by little, students began to view the bodies set before them not as people, but as objects. And indeed, they do today to some extent. This ability to divorce oneself emotionally came to characterize the mindset of the medical community in the, in the greater imagination of the public. In the Pickwick Papers, Charles Dickens describes a fictional but entirely credible conversation between two medical students on a frosty Christmas morning. He writes, have you finished that leg yet? Asked Benjamin Allen. Nearly, replies his colleague Bob Sawyer. It's very muscular for a child. Nothing like dissecting to give one an appetite. As medical students became desensitized in the 19th century, they also became irreverent, much to the public's horror. Now, this photo here is from a book by a man named James Edmondson, who was the curator of the Dittrich Museum, uh, a medical museum in Ohio. Uh, and I believe it's called Dissection Photos. You can find it on Amazon. And these were taken, obviously, at a, a later period to what I'm talking about. Um, when photography was sort of introduced into the dissection room. And I'm sure that everybody is in horror because this would never be allowed today, um, but these were very common in the late Victorian period. Pranks in the dead house were so common that at the time Joseph Lister entered medical school, they had indeed become a mark of the profession. Harper's new monthly magazine condemned the jet black humor and indifference towards the dead that seemed to pervade the dead house. Some students completely overstepped the bounds of decency and used the rotting body parts of their allotted cadavers as weapons, fighting mock duels with the severed legs and arms. But it wasn't all frivolity. Cutting open dead bodies also carried with it many physical risks, some of which were fatal. William Tennant Gardner, a professor at the University of Glasgow, addressed an incoming class with this dire message. He said, not a single session has passed over our heads since I was appointed to my office among you that has not paid its tax of life to the great reaper, whose harvest is always ready, whose sickle is never wary. Jacob Biglow, professor of surgery at Harvard University, also warned future medical students about the poisonous effects of a slight wound or crack in the skin made by the dissecting knife. These so-called pinprick cuts were a fast way to an early grave. The dangers were always present even for the most experienced anatomists, death was often inescapable for those trying their hardest to prevent it. The living in the form of disease patients were also taking a toll on those on the front line of medicine. Mortality rates amongst medical students and young doctors were very high. Between 1843 and 1859, 41 young men died after contracting fatal infections at St. Bartholomew's Hospital before ever qualifying. Those who succumbed to this manner were often eulogized as martyrs who had made the ultimate sacrifice in order to advance anatomical knowledge. Even those who survived often suffered some sort of illness during their hospital residencies. Indeed, the challenges were so great for those entering the profession that the surgeon John Abernathy frequently concluded his lectures by uttering bleakly, God help you all, what will become of you? So that gives you a little bit of a sense of what it was like for Joseph Lister when he entered medical school in the 1840s. Now, if you were lucky enough to survive that experience, which as we see was no guarantee, um, and if you were lucky enough to get one of the coveted hospital positions, 
which were very rare and scarce. This became the center of your universe. Now, I love this photo from the Burns Archive in New York because it really underlines the theatrical nature of operating in, at this time. Now, keep in mind, again, these photos date to a slightly later period. So what Lister would have been seeing and experiencing would have been even crazier, even more crowded, um, and certainly no kind of sterilization in, uh, in uh, process. So these operating theaters, they were filled to the rafters with ticketed spectators, as I said. People asked me, why would the Victorians you know, buy a ticket to the operating theater? They must have been quite morbid. But I like to remind audiences that there is a proliferation of medical programs. I'm sure that we've all consumed to one degree or another um, out there. And so I think our morbid curiosity, especially amongst the general public, about what happens in hospitals and what happens specifically in that operating theater is still uh, very much present. And the other thing was that the Victorians were obsessed with scientific progress, and there was no better place to witness the latest innovations than right there in these operating theaters. So there was a myriad of reasons why someone might buy a ticket or want to go into the operating theater, and not all of it had to do with sort of the grisly aspect of what was happening. Um, but they did come. And of course, they carried with them the grime and dirt of everyday life. These places were not sterile to any kind of comprehension that we would understand today. To give you an idea of the atmosphere on the day of an operation, the surgeon John Flynn South remarked that the rush and scuffle to get a place in the operating theater was not unlike that for a seat in the pit or gallery of a playhouse. People were packed like herrings in a basket with those in the back rows constantly jostling for a better view, shouting out heads, heads, whenever their, their line of sight was blocked. At times, the floor of the operating theater could be so crowded that it had to be cleared before the operation could commence. And again, you kind of see that in play in this photo, um, you know, from a later period. So again, we're, we're looking at something that's improved to what Lister would have been experiencing in the 1840s and 50s. But you do, you see people sitting right there on the operating uh, floor. Now, these men may not even be doctors. They might just be, you know, very important people who were invited, some dignitaries or whoever that was invited to witness this operation. And for all you surgeons out there who are listening, I mean, imagine operating this kind of atmosphere. To me, in this photo especially, it looks like they're crowded. There wouldn't be much room. Um, and at least in this photo, we're, there's probably some kind of antisepsis being practiced. But in Lister's period, of course, that wasn't happening at all. Surgery was a filthy business fraught with hidden dangers. I like to use this photo. This isn't actually a surgeon, it's a butcher, um, but it does give you an idea of what your friendly Victorian surgeon would look like. Most importantly, he would have been wearing that apron um, and the apron would have been filthy. It would have been covered in blood and you would have wanted your surgeon's apron to be covered in blood because it was a sign that he was a very senior experienced surgeon. He didn't clean it, it was, it was a badge of honor. And he rarely washed his hands or his instruments, and he carried with him a cadaverous smell, which they called good old hospital stink. So these places not just looked different, they didn't just feel different for the patient, um, but they, they smelled different as well. They were alien in every kind of way that we can imagine. Now, a lot of people ask, you know, it just makes sense to wash your hands. I can't imagine why this was such a difficult thing to get surgeons to do. But you have to remember that until there was an understanding of germ theory, it was difficult to convince anybody to wash their hands. There's probably people out there um, who know the name uh, Semmelweis. He was an early uh, surgeon who tried to get people to wash their hands. He, was, he ended up in a, a lunatic asylum. Um, they called him the hand washer and he died this very kind of tragic life. And he predated Lister. But the issue is that firstly, uh, Lister had no awareness of his work. His work never really went beyond the walls of his own hospital. And he wasn't treated well as it was by his colleagues. But the other part of that was that although he was putting together this idea that you could wash your hands and that mortality rates would go down on the wards, um, he, he didn't understand germ theory yet. And I think until you had that kind of explanation for why you should be washing your hands, it was difficult to get people uh, to change their, their methods because again, it would have slowed everything down if you had to constantly be washing your hands between patients. Now for the last part of this, I wanna to talk to you about 
three men who I cheekily re refer to as the butchers. Of course, they would not have referred to themselves that way. I do it to really underline the fact that these three men were trained in a pre-anesthetic era um, at a time when speed and strength were very important to the surgeon. And all three of these men play a big role in Joseph Lister's life. When Joseph Lister died, he actually uh, requested that his personal correspondence be destroyed. He wanted his story to be told through his science alone. But lucky for me, as the medical historian and storyteller, that didn't happen. We do have um, you know, all these letters between him and his father and all these people in his life. And I like to remind people that progress is not created in a vacuum and that we are very much the influences around us. And so these three men definitely had an influence on Lister. Now, the first is this guy, uh, Robert Liston. Um, when I was thinking about writing a book, I actually thought I might write it about him because he's this bigger than life character. He's 6'2", he's incredibly tall for the Victorian period. He's so strong and so fast that he could hold you down with his left arm and he could take your leg off in 30 seconds, which is exactly what you would want if you didn't have anesthesia. And as a result of this speed, he was known as the fastest knife in the West End. But this speed was, you know, a blessing as well as a curse. He got into all these crazy predicaments. Uh, for instance, there was a, a patient who was brought into the operating theater, was going to have a stone removed. We remember how terrible that was from Stephen Pollard's story. This patient was put onto the table and looked at Robert Liston, who would have been quite the sight at his height and his strength with the blood apron. And he decided he didn't wanna go through with it. So he jumped off the table, he ran across the room, he locked himself in the closet and Liston wasn't even phased by this. He chased this guy right down through the hallway. He ripped the door off the closet and he dragged this guy back into the operating room and he removed the stone. <laughs> so this is the kind of character that he was. Um, another very famous Robert Liston story was that he was operating at one point, and like I said, speed was both a curse and a blessing. He would, to facilitate the speed, he would actually hold these bloody instruments between his teeth just to really underline how different it was back then. And he was moving so fast that he accidentally took off his assistant's finger. And as he was switching blades, he cut the coat of a spectator. And it was said that the patient died of gangrene, the assistant died of gangrene, and the spectator died right then and there of fright. <laughs> so it is jokingly referred to as the only operation with a 300% mortality rate, which I think we can all agree was quite an achievement um, back then. So when I learned about Robert Liston, I thought, this is, this is the story I want to tell. But the problem was that Liston didn't shift the paradigm. And I ultimately wanted to write a story about something that had happened that had changed the way we understand the world. However, Robert Liston does open the butchering art because he performs the first operation under ether in Britain in December, 1846. He doesn't discover ether. It's brought from America. He doesn't even think it's going to work. He calls it the Yankee Dodge, but he's a showman and he wants to give it a try. So it's a cold December day, everybody files into this operating theater, he's going to try ether. And he did what he always did, which is to walk into this operating theater and he said, time me gentlemen. And for me, I can almost hear the ripple of pocket watches as they came out to time the great Robert Liston. And it worked, it was a miracle. The age of agony was over, so the medical journals declared. It was a huge moment in medical history. Now, I wanted to start the butchering art there because I think if anybody's ever given any thought to medical history, they tend to think of that moment. That's the big moment we're ushered into the modern era. But actually, surgery becomes much more dangerous immediately following the advent of anesthesia because surgeons still don't understand germ theory, but they're more willing to pick up the knife. Um, they no longer have the patient fighting them. Uh, they don't have to drag the patient back to the operating theater. So they're more willing to pick up the knife. They're more willing to go deeper into the body. And as a result, these operations become nothing more than slow moving executions. And what was incredible about that moment in December 1846 was that a 17 year old Joseph Lister was in the audience. And I always joke, I'm trying to get this made into a movie. I couldn't write a better movie script than that moment. You have ether and anesthesia, the dawn of anesthesia, and then you have the baton being passed to 17 year old Joseph Lister who was ultimately going to solve one of the greatest medical mysteries of all time. So the book opens there and Robert Liston appears uh, throughout. 
The next guy I want to tell you about is this guy, James Syme. Now, Syme was the cousin of Robert Liston, uh, but he was built very differently. He was very short. Um, his cousin was 6'2", and he could hold you down. And he could use his hand like a tourniquet. Syme actually had to use a tourniquet, uh, which uh, Robert Liston used to make fun of him about. You know, such were the, such were the, the squabbles between medical <laughs> communities at that time. And as a result, he was known as the Napoleon of surgery. Um, if anybody out there recognizes the name Syme, it might be because we still practice one of his techniques to remove a diseased foot at the ankle joint. Before Syme comes along, if you had a diseased foot, you typically lost it right below the knee, um, which of course had a greater impact on mobility. Um, and especially when you're talking about Victorian Britain, when there's no social network, you know, losing your leg below the knee could have a greater impact on your life than for instance, losing just the foot at the ankle joint. So we still practice that today. Now where his cousin was fearless, Syme was even more so. In 1828, this man named Robert Penman comes to Syme and he has been suffering from this lower jaw tumor for the last eight years. Um, a lot of people ask, well, how could he have, you know, let it got to the stage? But of course, going into these hospitals certainly did not mean that you were going to walk out of the hospital. And I think a lot of patients just hoped that it would go away or it just wouldn't get worse. But in Penman's case, it was getting worse. It was going to eventually kill him and he knew it. Actually, Penman went to Robert Liston first because Robert Liston had just made a name for himself for removing a scrotal tumor, 45 pound scrotal tumor in under four minutes without any anesthetic. Um, so if you had heard about that, you would think Robert Liston's my man. But Robert Liston looks at this tumor and he says, I can't operate, which is really tantamount to a death sentence for someone like poor Robert Penman. Penman doesn't give up. He goes up to Edinburgh in Scotland to meet with James Syme, who does agree to do the operation. Now, before anesthesia, patients weren't typically laid down. They were sat in these very high chairs. Um, the chairs were very high so that they couldn't brace with their feet. They couldn't, their feet would dangle um, so they couldn't push off and struggle against the knife. And he was restrained. And for 24 minutes, this was cut out of his face bit by bit and dropped in a bucket at their feet. It would have been horrible for Penman. It would have been horrible for Syme. I cannot imagine it. I can't even get my teeth cleaned without some kind of numbing agent. So this is the kind of thing that Syme decided to undertake. And Penman pulls through. In fact, later in life, Syme bumps into him and he said uh, that he was uh, delighted that Penman didn't bear any traumatic scars from this surgery. So that kind of led me down this rabbit hole. And I ended up finding a photo of Mr. Penman later in life. And, you know, I mean, we know the story. So this is miraculous, actually. He looks pretty good for having undergone such a horrific operation. And clearly the scars are um, hidden under this beard. But I did show this photo to a friend and I didn't tell them the story beforehand. And uh, she said that he looked like an ugly Abraham Lincoln. And, you know, Lincoln wasn't known for his looks. So to be an ugly Abraham Lincoln is quite something. I think that we can agree that there's probably something off with his face. It looks like his jaw has been narrowed a bit, but it is a miracle that this man went through such an incredible surgery. He lived um, and, and lived well and lived long after it. So Syme was an incredible surgeon. Now, Joseph Lister at one point in his medical studies has a mental breakdown and he leaves medical school and he ends up going up to Scotland and he meets James Syme. And it's Syme who reinvigorates this love of surgery in Lister. And Lister falls in love with his daughter and Syme becomes his father-in-law. So he plays a huge role in Lister's life. And for various reasons that I go into in the book, which I won't go into here, Scotland is the right place for Lister because Scotland's educational system is more scientifically targeted. So people are more receptive to his ideas when he first comes out with them. Although there was plenty of pushback in Scotland as well. Now, the last guy I wanna tell you about very quickly here is this guy named John Eric Erickson. Now, medical historians remember him for saying in 1840 that surgery had come as far as it was ever going to go, that the knife would never go any deeper, that they had reached the, the sort of zenith of their profession. And I just want to say that anybody who says that about anything 
will always be proved wrong in history. So, you know, we're always progressing, we're always changing and altering our methods and ways. But of course, Erickson couldn't imagine a time when we can control pain through anesthesia, and he certainly couldn't imagine a time when we can control post-operative infection. Now, the story I want to tell you is um, a story that I tried to tell on NPR when my book came out, but they had the foresight to pre-record me. There's very few people who put me on live TV or live radio because they never know what's going to, you know, sort of come out of my mouth. And probably this audience is, is less phased by a general audience with these stories. But the reason I want to tell you this story is not because it's gruesome, but because it really underlines how far we've come in such a short time historically. Now, Erickson was working at the hospital one evening and Joseph Lister was attending as a student and a woman came in and she was asphyxiating on all this blood and pus in her throat. And so Erickson cut into her trachea and all this blood and pus begins to spill out of this wound. And in an inspired moment, he lowers his mouth onto this wound. He sucks this blood and pus out three mouthfuls. And there is just, it's so mind blowing to me that this had happened. And for the purposes of my book, it would have been better if Erickson had died, if the patient had died, but if for some strange reason, they both survived this horrible experience. But there's nothing I can tell you that is more alien than the idea of you lowering your mouth onto this patient. You know, you don't, you don't know anything about the patient's health and sucking all this wound and this pus um, out, of this, out of this wound. So Erickson is definitely in the book. Now I'm coming to the very end of, of my talk here, and it may occur to you that I haven't actually told you that much about Joseph Lister, who is seated here, surrounded um, by his, his peers, looking very thoughtful. And one of the reasons I do that is by design, because I really want people to go on that journey with Joseph Lister and, and learn with him how he pieces this puzzle together. But what I can tell you, um, firstly, is something we've already established at the top was that he took Louis Pasteur's theory about germs and he applied it to medical practice. Now, what was happening with Pasteur was he was trying to understand why wine vats were spoiling. You see, this is very important to the French. You know, the wine is very important. So he wanted to understand why these wine vats were spoiling. And he discovered that it was this, these germs, this bacteria that was getting in. Now, Lister reads this and he realizes that what is making the wine go sour might also be making the wound go sour. In fact, surgeons used to use that term. It's something would heal sourly or something would heal sweetly. And he realized that wounds became infected when there was compound fractures, when there was a break in the skin. So he was reasoning that something was coming from the outside. Now, Lister was really well placed to understand Louis Pasteur's germ theory because as a Quaker, he was not allowed as a little boy to uh, partake in traditional forms of entertainment such as dancing or playing a musical instrument, but he was allowed to study nature. And his father gave him a microscope when he was a boy. And it was this microscope he brought to medical school and it was uh, the microscope he brought to Scotland. So he was more scientifically receptive. At this time, the microscope wasn't really used in medicine for various reasons. Um, so, so he's well placed, he reads about this, he starts to do his experiments, he's more scientifically trained and minded because of his upbringing. He's sort of the perfect person at that right time. Now, what I can tell you is that when Lister came out with his theories and started to develop antisepsis, there was a lot of pushback. This shouldn't surprise us because this is the story of progress in science and medicine. Oftentimes the greatest pushback comes from within the community. And people struggled to understand why it was so hard for these surgeons to accept this. But I remind them that you have to imagine that there's this young guy and he's coming along and he's saying that there are these invisible little creatures and they're killing your patients. And you have to believe me because I can see them with my microscope. This was a huge leap of faith. The other part of that was that Lister was essentially telling these older surgeons that they had been inadvertently killing their patients all along. And is sort of comical as we can look at this through the lens of the 21st century, you have to remember that these surgeons were in the business of saving lives just as surgeons are today. 
And so to go into that operating theater time and again, and to face these high mortality rates and lose your patients, it would have been really disheartening and frustrating. And I think that was a hard pill for them to swallow. Lister ultimately wins, thank goodness. Um, and he does that by turning to the younger generation and he convinces them of germs and of the need to adopt antisepsis. And they become known as the Listerians and they spread the gospel of Lister, so to speak. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why people are very receptive at the time that the Listerians kind of go out into the world and start spreading this message. Now, what I want to leave you with is this visual before and after snapshot of, of a before Lister and after Lister. Now, if you get the book today, this is the North American cover. This is a very famous painting you might be familiar with called The Gross Clinic. Um, I believe it's in, in Philadelphia. And it's by a man named Thomas Eakins in the 19th century. Samuel Gross at the middle so didn't believe in Lister. He so didn't believe in germs that he would walk into the operating theater, he'd slam the door and he'd say, there, Mr. Lister's germs can't get in anymore. So you very much see that playing out in this extraordinary painting. Here is Samuel Gross, he's in his street clothes. Um, they're sticking their filthy fingers into this wound. There's someone shielding their face in the background. That's the mother of the patient. And she's wearing black because she expects her son to die. So that was the painting that we used for the cover of the North American edition. Now, the British edition, uh, we went with another painting done by Eakins within 10 years of the first one. Now, this has been stylized a little bit by Penguin, my publisher, but you get a sense of what that would have looked like in its 19th century glory. This is called the Agnew Clinic. And again, same artist within 10 years. And you certainly see that paradigm shift here. This still doesn't look like how we operate, but there's something different is, is going on. It's lighter, it's brighter. Um, they're wearing white. There is a, a, a sense that these people might understand germs. There's a sense that they might be using antisepsis. And we also start to see women appearing in the role of the nurse, um, which is extraordinary. So at the same time that the Listerian revolution is going on, we have the Florence Nightingale revolution going on. So a lot of incredible big changes in medicine going on in the late 19th century. And I love that these book covers are in conversation with uh, one another. So the last thing I wanna leave you with is um, Terry, our, our wonderful tech guy is going to help with is, I filmed a book trailer for the butchering art in the old operating theater in London. And if you ever get to London, um, you can uh, see this incredible space. It's the second oldest one in existence in the world. Um, and I, it, we recreated, my friends are filmmakers, we recreated a young Lister uh, attending a pre-anesthetic surgery and wondering why his patients die. And I wanted to show it to you to give you a sense of what that operating theater looks like. So I'll let Terry do that. Thank you. My name is Lindsay Pateras, and this is the trailer to my upcoming book, The Butchering Art, which is all about the brutal and bloody world of Victorian surgery. Enjoy. Salad. I'm going to cut it off.
There you are. Aren't you coming? He died. Who? The docker we were operating upon last night. He died half an hour ago. Yeah, well, that ain't really unusual, Joseph. No. No, that's the thing of it, isn't it? It's odd, don't you think? Given the body's remarkable inclination to heal itself, you don't think it's odd? Why, when we give it the opportunity, we take away disease, we afford it the chance to grow strong again, why do they die? Trauma, Joseph. No, no, not in so many. Too many are dying. These are strong men, James. Men who lead harder lives than you or I could tolerate. We operate on shipbuilders, laborers, ferriers, the toughest breeds in the land. No, there's more to this than trauma. There has to be more to it than that. Something hidden from our understanding. <laughs> it's the supernatural then. Gods, monsters. <laughs> I don't know, take your pick. Hey, we might have to burn the hospital down from time to time. <laughs> Come on, I don't want to be late. Monsters. Monsters. Mister! Come on! We knew we were in contact with genius. We felt we were helping in the making of history. And that all things were becoming new. Well, <laughs> my my friends are, are filmmakers, and we kind it kind of got out of control, and we just wanted to see if we could make this thing. But I, I always like to give a plug to the old operating theater in London. They're really struggling in this pandemic. It's a fantastic space if you do find yourself in the UK. So, thank you so much. I hope you found that interesting. I'd be happy to take questions if there's any time. Sure, Lindsay. Thank you so much. I, I, you know, we're all surgeons pretty much on the line, and I think we all had a hard time looking at that uh, video <laughs> and that grisly um, amputation. So, uh, thank, thankfully, we're in a different era, different world. But it's because yeah. of individuals who paved the way for us, like uh, Joseph Lister. So, your your presentation was amazing, wonderful. Thank you, on behalf of all of us. We are a bit out of time, so I'm I'm just going to um, mention to the folks who came uh, on the line today. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, please uh, read The Butchering Art that uh, many of you have a copy of now. Please also look for Lindsay's next book, which will be on uh, plastic surgery and the history thereof, and the Smithsonian series that she's um, been um, got a, a movie um, contract with. Please uh, keep your eyes open for that. Um, and uh, Lindsay, it was a real pleasure to have you here. We, yeah. we know that you had spent time previously in Toronto, and we hope some at a later time and date we'll be able to... Uh, to get you back here. So thank you on behalf of all of us in the Department of Surgery. Um, those in the book club who are on the um, attendee side, please stay there. And we're gonna bring you over to have a, a brief session with uh, Lindsay now, but uh, thanks to everyone who joined today. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and Lindsay, thank you on behalf of all of us once again. Thank you, thank you everybody. Okay, and exec members, if you wish to stay, you're welcome to, but uh, book club members are coming over, Terry, if you can get everybody over here that uh, we sent uh, before, that'd be great. 
Yeah, Lindsay, wonderful. And, and you had fantastic uh, images too in, in uh, slide oh. the show from that era. So really- It's funny because you, know, you say us. that it's, it's hard it's for really well. you to watch uh, the, the uh, video, but I've had several people faint <laughs> when I show that video to the general public because yeah. you know, we can actually show the cutting, but I think the your imagination you know, kind of puts you on that table and what that would have been like. Um, but it's, it's, it's just, uh, it's an extraordinary story. And I really hope that I can get it made into a movie because also, by the way, our Lister was Canadian. He did a very good job at a oh, British cool. accent there, but um, we had a lot of fun making that. You know, Lister was a remarkable man. I mean, we didn't get a chance to uh, explore that, but uh, you know, you mentioned his Quaker heritage and background. Uh, what, what struck me from the book and, and reading what you wrote was, uh, you know, he, he was, he was extremely virtuous and um, yes. honesty and integrity were just, you know, things that he lived his uh, life uh, by. He abided uh, by those uh, concepts and uh, he bumped up against the medical system, but he, he really uh, was phenomenal at keeping his, he was very steady, just keeping his uh, path forward. So. He did, he didn't, he had this, uh, habit of not charging his patients he he said that the, it, they it determined up to them you know how much they would pay him which really ticked off a lot of his colleagues because he was you know he was very much um into healing people and as you say it was very the quaker religion played a huge role in that yeah. um it's interesting because this book um or yeah the butchering art with lister lister isn't as much of a character as you know i was talking about robert liston and certainly different to harold gillies who i'm going to be writing the next book on who was a real prankster and he was doing all these kind of crazy things during world war one to keep up morale um he would even go into these hospital wards dressed as a as a, a alternative persona and gamble with the guys and bring in champagne and um so it's so very different character but i think that lister was really he was the right person at the right time yeah. in history, um, and and thank goodness he was there for for to push us into that um, yeah. paradigm. So, so Lindsay, thank you again. We'll just spend a few minutes if it's okay with you. And I brought members of our book club in the Department of Surgery over because over the years we've um, tackled and read some amazing uh, books. They're not uh, typically related to uh, medical history. In fact, very few are. Uh, but um, there are a lot of interested parties here. I want to introduce to you Carol Swallow, who's the division chair at the University of uh, Toronto in general surgery. Jaime Escalon, who's a breast uh, cancer surgeon. Uh, Blaine Said, who's a transplant uh, surgeon. Dean Elterman, a uh, urologist. Augusto Zani, who's a pediatric general surgeon. Suna Das, a uh, neurosurgeon. And uh, Najma Ahmed, I didn't introduce earlier, sur surgeon-in-chief at um, St. Michael's Hospital. So. Uh, Lindsay, we may have some questions from our book club members. Is that okay? If, um, yeah, Absolutely. so Carol, Carol's going to lead the way with the first question. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed uh, reading your book. Uh, extremely entertaining. And I felt the level that you're sort of pitching it at seemed to be for quite an educated audience, sort of scientifically and medically educated. And I also was struck by how you start with the mise-en-scene, sort of at the tipping point. Uh, really engaging all of us. So I'm wondering, when you set out, how do you decide, you know, who are you, who are you aiming for? And how much does that influence the way you write? Does an editor come along and say, oh, no, no, no all of this is going to have to change? I mean, who makes these decisions? Who makes those decisions? Oh, that's a really good question. I mean, the process is pretty, it was, is pretty brutal. Um, this book came about completely randomly. Um, I was telling James about this on, on a different session, but I went through a really horrible divorce and, um, and it was very sudden and my ex disappeared literally. And what happened was I was um, facing uh, deportation from the UK and they took my passport and I wasn't allowed to work and I had no money. So I decided I wanted to write a book. And um, I went through a lot of different topics with a literary agent, but she kept pushing back. And then I came across Joseph Lister's story and I thought, well, somebody had to have written this book. Like this is too important. Someone had to, and nobody had written about it, um, at least in a, in a kind of commercial sense. And that prologue that opens with Liston is more or less what I wrote um, when I was going to pitch the book and when I went through the proposal process. So that really much stayed the same. But then the proposal itself, it's, it's quite long. It's um, you know, typically about 20,000 words. So you really map out where you're going. And then you submit it and you hope for the best. And for me, it was 
a life-changing moment for me. The, the a, two publishers wanted to buy it. I think a lot of it was down to also the Nick, if anybody's seen that television show, um, it was very popular. So this was kind of like the precursor to the Nick. And I tell people that, you know, Joseph Lister saved a lot of people's lives. And I feel like he kind of saved mine because he lifted me out of this really terrible situation. And I, I got to do this amazing thing and go tell his story. So I, I you know, feel very passionate about Lister beyond the fact that it's a great story. Um, but yeah, to your question, I mean, I had, I had an editor, um, every, every author has an editor and um, it went through a lot of like red markings. I mean, I think I went through about eight different iterations. Uh, originally, I wanted to have Louis Pasteur as a bigger um, presence, but the, the publisher felt that that was a story that was already known. They really wanted it to be Lister focused. Um, and things that you don't have control over, by the way, title. Um, I did pitch this as the butchering art. It came from a Lister quote but they wanted to change it to something awful. I can't even remember what it was. And I kind of really doubled down on them. And I said, no, I, I really think it should be the butchering art cover. They came up with a terrible cover. It was horrible. It had like blood all over it. I said, no, it can't be that. Let's, let's go into more Victorian. So there's a lot of um, interesting process that the author doesn't necessarily have like complete control over. So that was a, a eye opening for me, but, but for me, you know, I just go where the story is. And, and the next story for me was um, uh, about Harold Gillies. Cause I thought it was an incredible heroic tale and in world war one. And um, so it's, it, it can take a while before you kind of figure out what that story is. But once you do, it's, for me, it's like an instant kind of love. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, other questions. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Lindsay, so I, I enjoy your book a lot. I, I'm just curious, you briefly mentioned textbooks. So what's the situation with textbook and surgery in the, at that time? Uh, well, there were textbooks. I mean, it, it, the thing about surgeons, and I can't remember, I lived in Canada for a brief time, but I can't remember if surgeons go by the title doctor. Do they go by the title doctor? Yeah. Okay. Well, they don't in the UK. They still go by Mr., Ms., Mrs. over here. In fact, I had an appendectomy early on when I moved to the UK, and they said, like, Mr. Smith was going to do it, and I thought, who is this guy? You know, like, it just felt very odd that they, they don't use that doctor title, but that's a hangover from the fact that surgeons were um, not necessarily formally educated through university, they were craftsmen. They were men who uh, had to make a living with their hands. So mm -hmm. if you were a, a wealthy um, you know, class family, you wouldn't want your son being a surgeon. That was kind of a step down. And so it's quite opposite to, of course, how we view surgery today. Um, there were textbooks, though, um, but you know, I don't think that they were as useful as textbooks are today. I think one of the things about Lister's case books that are interesting is that he admits to his failures. So you don't always see this with the surgeons in the past. They kind of overblow their successes. And so you don't really get a sense um, of what's going on. People always ask like, what were the mortality rates in these hospitals? It's before you know statistical information was really taken in any kind of serious way. So that was also, it's really hard to kind of gauge. And of course it depended from hospital to hospital, but yeah, there was definitely, you know, textbooks. There's, um, I have some of Lister's volumes like right here on my bookshelf too, that um, the collected works of Joseph Lister. And <laughs> um, and in fact, in that, that book uh, trailer at the very end, the director, my friend Alex wanted me to be carrying all of Lister's published works as I kind of walked past the, the Lister on screen. So um, that was a bit fun. Yeah, we actually have that same book in the Department of Surgery. Uh, members on, on the line may not know that, but you're welcome to, to read it anytime you wish. Uh, other questions from, and thanks, Jaime, for your question. Sonit, do you have a question? Okay. Lindsay, thanks so much. That was a great uh, hour with us, and uh, yeah. I really enjoyed reading your book. Um, so I, I'm reading a book now about the French gynecologist Samuel Posey, who oh. was one of the list rights that you mentioned. Right. And um, in... In the biography, uh, it makes note of the fact that Posse goes to Scotland to spend time with Lister. And it led me to think, and it's not something this answered to me, uh, for me, you know, we have all these, we have a whole uh, industry right now that is meant to allow us to disperse information to each other. Um, and you think about during the pandemic, how critical it's been that we have these means of communication. How would Posey have found out what Lister was doing in Scotland in the 19th century? 
God, how, how, did, how was I, I've been doing this for so long. I have never had that question. It's, a, it's such an interesting question and also well done for really going down the rabbit hole with, <laughs> with medical history there. Um, yeah, that it's, it's a great question. I mean, first of all, in a weird kind of way, the 19th century was sort of like the wild west of, of innovation because there was no regulation. So when ether, for instance, is discovered um, in 1846, it only takes a few weeks before Liston is trying it in London. That would just not, I mean, it didn't have to go through any safety trials or anything. So people just kind of heard about this stuff. And also, by the way, the doctors, they were experimenting with this. Um, it was very common, you know, to be uh, they, they would actually um, create ether cocktails. They would um, drink the, the ether and they were doing all kinds of crazy things. They were sniffing it. You had ethereal uh, experiences. That's where we get that term. Um, doctors were experimenting with cocaine on themselves. Again, if you watch the Nick, it's loosely based off a surgeon named Halstead who was a very well-known cocaine addict. Um, so there, news did travel, and it traveled through medical journals, of course, um, there were a lot of, I, I mean, actually, the medical journals are really funny at this time, because everybody's sniping at each other. I mean, I'm sure that you guys all have professional squabbles here and there, but it was nothing like the 19th century. I mean, you'd get in a duel with someone over something really stupid. Um, and then when Lister succeeds, so, that, so about the period now that we're talking about that you're reading about, Lister becomes very famous. He actually lives into his own fame and he was really embarrassed by that. And so all of this stuff kind of um, it comes out like carbolic acid products and you have Listerine and all this kind of stuff. So people would have known about him and they would want to travel and study with him. And he was a great teacher as well. Um, so it was really common that these, these people would come from all over the world to kind of study with the great um, Joseph Lister and then again became the Listerians. But a lot, of, a lot of news traveled through the medical journals, through the newspapers themselves, and Ward certainly got a, a, around. I'm saying that, you know, when I make this movie, I'm saying when I make it, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I get the green light, we're going to have to condense the timeline because we can't age Lister. But this took a long time. It took, you know, 15, 20 years for people to really get on board with this. But if you do end up seeing the Hollywood movie, don't blame me. It's going to be, it's going to look like Lister kind of just instantly convinced people, but that's just the way it has to be on screen. But thanks for your question. Yes, and that's a great question. And, you know, by the push of a button now on PubMed, we can find out who's doing what in a nanosecond. But back then, yeah, I'm sure news traveled a little bit more slowly, but uh, it is interesting how reputations uh, could be learned about and, and how people could follow the news. Uh, Blaine has uh, his hand up. Blaine, a question for Lindsay? Hi, Lindsay. Good morning. Thanks for a great talk and thanks for joining us. I really very much enjoyed it and I very much enjoyed uh, reading The Butchering Art. I have a quick question and maybe a little bit of follow up on, uh, on Carol's question from before. I'm curious how, you know, in surgery or in medicine, we are often kind of wary about how much we disclose to the public about what really goes on. And obviously when you're in, and certainly in transplant surgery, uh, there's this kind of fine line that we have to walk. We want to encourage organ donation, but in, you know, many settings, we, it's a very kind of macabre, strange thing that we do, taking organs from dead people, putting them into living people. And I'm curious, when you're writing about surgery, how do you, you do a great job, at, to my eye, in reading and the butchering art of kind of walking that fine line, not over sensationalizing, but also not shying away from it. How did you strike that balance? How do you strike that balance? You know, and, and I guess this gets back a little bit the editing process that you were talking about before and, 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 for, and specifically with that uh, respect. Yeah, I, that's a great question as well. I mean, <clears throat> I'm still learning as a writer as well. And there, there are things, you know, I had, I was flipping through the butchering art because it's been a while and I've been working on this other book and there are definitely things that maybe I would have changed. You know, they all, they, there's a famous saying that art is never completed. It's just abandoned. So you kind of just get to a stage where you just kind of have to let go of it. Um, but I, you know, the book is, is gruesome. But I always say that um, I wouldn't be doing the patients justice who went through these experiences if I wasn't really explaining what that was like. And I also don't think we can understand the impact that someone like Lister had unless we understand what it really felt like and looked like and all of that before. But it's there's definitely a balance there. And um, I ran into, kind of go back to Carol's question, like how do you, you pick a, a subject? I ran into the Gillies book with plastic surgery without really thinking through the implications of what it meant to do something about World War I. Because over here in the UK, these records are sealed. 
Um, and so in the instance with Gillies, uh, because this happened relatively recently, for instance, in order to even get into the records, I had to prove that these guys had actually died, which is insane. I mean, that we, it, can you imagine if I found one of them, one of them was still alive um, from 1914? But, but I had to go through this whole process. And the other part was that Gillies, um, he published a lot of his cases with these men's names. And I'm free to use that because it's in the public domain. But for instance, if I went into a case file and I found out something about that patient that he hadn't included in his published work, I couldn't use that uh, with that patient's name in my book. So this has been really challenging in a way that the butchering art just wasn't challenging because the 19th century, everything's kind of, you know, the further back you go, it's not patient confidentiality. Also with the Gillies book, um, I was trying to find that arc, you know, with Lister, it's very obvious we're, we're building towards his discovery, his antisepsis, and then of course on the downside of how he convinces people. But with Gillies, it, was, it wasn't so obvious. I came across this diary of a man named Percy Clare who was shot in 1917, he shot um, through the cheek and it comes out the other side. And he lays on the battlefield for days before he's brought um, off that battlefield. And then he's sent to uh, the wrong hospital and there's all kinds of challenges just to get into Gilly's hands. So the book, we see Percy Clare throughout the book, you know, what's gonna happen to him? How does he finally get to the specialty um, reconstruction hospital? Uh, and I contacted the woman who donated this diary to the collection and I, I needed her permission to use him in the book. And she said, you know, I don't even know anything about him. I found it in my garage. So it's going to be a really strange thing for her because hopefully the book will do well and she's going to learn about this relative of hers who went through this incredible experience. But but yeah, it's a it's a challenge, I think. And um, I don't want to talk about her, but as I said, I really feel strongly that um, I have to be true to their experiences and we kind of have to, we have to just brave that experience with them. One of the best reviews I got from an Amazon reader was this book gets more boring as it goes on <laughs> because of course when Lister comes on the scene and everybody starts surviving and everything's cleaned up, you know, we don't have the kind of horrific horror going on. So, um, but, but yeah, it's, it's, it is a fine line and it's not for everybody. And I get that as well. Great. Thanks uh, Blaine for your question. Augusto had a question. Yes, uh, thank you, Lindsay. It was a fantastic lecture, and uh, I have to say, everything that g goes around the Victorian age is always fascinating. I trained in the UK, and I can tell you that uh, when you pass the Royal College of uh, Surgeons exam, you're so proud of being called uh, Mister, and you get rid of actually the title Doctor. Uh, it, it, it's it's, it's <laughs> quite interesting, and, and then, of course, I came to Canada uh, seven years ago. And then of course, you, you, I had to adapt to, yeah. to change again back to a doctor. Um, my question is to you as a historian. So when I think of Lister, uh, the, the other person that came to my mind was uh, Ignatius Semmelweis, yeah. who's uh, another pioneer of uh, uh, antisepsis. And uh, uh, he is the one who discovered the, the, the incident, incidents of uh, puerperal fever uh, mm -hmm. in uh, um, uh, these ladies that, uh, and, and, and uh, he associated that uh, with uh, the fact that the surgeons and uh, obsanganis at that time were not washing their hands. And, and so I tried to read, and I didn't remember when he, this was happening. I knew that it was in the 19th century. It was like 20 years before. Yeah. And, uh, and he had traveled to across Europe, uh, although he got kicked out of uh, Medical University of Vienna. Uh, but he gave a lecture in London and there was a review of his discoveries uh, in, uh, um, in, the in the Lancet. So I was wondering whether Lister was aware or had heard of these um, uh, Semmelweis and, uh, and, and this association of uh, dirty ants and uh, purple fever yeah, I mean, from a historical I perspective. People love Semmelweis. It's funny, I just wrote a piece, uh, well, I wrote a piece at the, the top of the pandemic about Semmelweis for the Wall Street Journal, because it's like, it's that romantic story too, you know, he he's called the hand washer and they put him in a lunatic asylum and he dies as a result. And it's just this kind of horrific, weird story. Um, Lister actually goes to Semmelweis's hospital years after he dies and Lister has triumphed. And they asked him if he knew of Semmelweis's works and he said, no. I think Semmelweis's impact was 
pretty minimal. Although today we now look backwards and we say, why was nobody listening to this man? He was right on some level. Um, the other part of that is that I think the reason why Semmelweis wasn't as successful um, as he was, and the difference between Semmelweis and Lister is this. Semmelweis still doesn't understand germ theory. So although he's putting together this idea that you wash your hands and incidences of infection go down in the hospital wards, he doesn't know why. And I think that until there was that, that understanding of germ theory, it was very hard to convince surgeons to do this because it just didn't make any sense. Why would you spend all this time washing your instruments? Who cares? Um, and, but until you understand germ theory. So that's one of the main differences between Semmelweis and Lister. Um, the other thing is, you know, I'm, an, I, I'm a historian, I have a PhD from Oxford, I'm not an academic anymore, but academics love to uh, use me as an, an example of bad history sometimes, but the truth is that commercial books have to be entertaining, and I'm trying to get people on board who don't have a PhD in the subject, but of course there was a more nuanced story going on. There were a lot of surgeons who were trying to solve this mystery, they didn't do it successfully, um, like Lister did. So there are people uh, sort of orbiting around Lister. Um, Semmelweis could arguably be one of them that is starting to do things like hand washing or maybe experimenting with antisepsis, but it's really Lister who solves it and marries that scientific principle ultimately to medical practice. And that was the really important part of it. Um, but yeah, Semmelweis, he's a great character. I feel like I, everybody loves him so much. I feel like I should definitely look at writing a book about Semmelweis, Semmelweis at some point, but he is a very romantic figure, especially uh, today we look back at the hand washer and realize he was very right. Great, thanks, Augusto. Any other questions from the panelists? Okay. Lindsay, I have a quick question. I have two quick questions. One is, you know, in the process of being a, a medical historian, are you finding it easier in the age of the internet where you can just do your research or are you having to go to like these catacombs and these libraries and Oxford and Glasgow to unearth these things? And then the, my second quick question is, I, I don't know if you really follow contemporary medicine and surgery. But let's say I ask you in 20 years from now, looking back uh, in 2020-ish, what would be some of the important things that you think people will be writing about 30, 40 years yeah, from now? Because it's an explosion of knowledge, right? So there's, there's so much more yeah. now. Yeah, I mean, and I love that you asked that question because I, when I talk to medical audiences, I always hope that the thing that the take home they take from the butchering art is that what we know today isn't going to be what we know tomorrow. You know, we're always constantly changing. We need to be open to new ideas. Of course, COVID is the obvious, you know, in 20, 30 years, there's going to be a historian who's going to tell this story and going to be able to contextualize all the political threads and, you know, how we handle this pandemic. Um, but I always, I always ask, you know, I'm on social media and I tell a lot of medical history stories and I think it's easy to kind of look back at, you know, Robert Liston cutting fingers off and stuff and kind of laugh about this. But of course, you know, it was very serious business back then. And what is the thing today that we might look at in 20 years ago? I can't believe that we, you know, and maybe, um, you know, there'll be, there'll be more effective uh, treatments for cancer. Maybe we'll start phasing out chemotherapy. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not a doctor, but I think that there's certain practices that will be replaced by, you know, better practices. And we might look back at certain treatments and wonder how we ever survived or pushed through those kinds of treatments. It's really a, a wondrous time in medicine. Um, and it's, it's hard to keep up with all of the advances that we're making. Um, or even look at the vaccine front. You know, this new technology now that we have with these vaccines is absolutely fascinating. And uh, to your, your other question about um, how I do my research, it's the internet is a wonderful thing <laughs> because right now in the UK, we're in full complete lockdown. I can't even drive uh, very far from my house. I could get fined. Um, so lucky for me, a lot of the documents that I have are accessible online. There's wonderful archivists who, who are digitalizing this stuff as we speak. Um, but I still do go into the, you know, into the big libraries. I did my PhD at Oxford. I still love handling the documents when it's possible. But um, thankfully, you know, it's, it's much easier now to kind of ingest uh, history through these collections. So yeah, well, thanks, uh, Dean. That's a great question, and especially the one about how um, we look back at the even the surgery we've been doing in our time. I, when I think back now, I've been practicing almost thirty years. Where where I started my practice 
and where I am today, I, I look back 30 years ago and think, boy, that was pretty brutal what we were doing then. And yeah. everything's become, as you know, miniaturized, um, smaller incisions, uh, robotics, et cetera. I mean, it's really changed a lot. And, and, you know, in the historian's eye, if you look back just even 30 years, you would say, why the hell were they doing those types of procedures? Uh, but obviously it's innovation continues. And, and 30 years from now, it'll be amazing as well. It's amazing. I mean, with Gillies as well to go back because he's, he's on my mind. I mean, he does the first um, female to male gender reassignment in the late 40s, early 50s. I mean, this is incredible. And he was really at the, the cutting edge. He was very creative. I mean, we can say that, you know, plastic surgery is a creative discipline as well. He was an artist. Um, he, he, you know, was, was very good at what he did. And um, I tell odd, I, I talk to people about this, the fact that he was doing these kinds of operations and it blows people's minds that this was going on as early as it did. And just look at how far things have gone, even when looking at facial reconstruction, now we're doing full face transplants, which is absolutely incredible. And even in the past, like three years, what those full face transplants have looked like are getting better and better. I think I saw one recently and it's, we're just improving so much. Um, and it's, I, I do say, although we're going through a terrible time right now, we still are very lucky, you know, to live in 2021 because the technology and the things that we can do for patients is, is really wondrous comparatively. Yeah, great, Lindsay. Well, you've been very generous with your time. Thank you for this. Uh, on behalf of the book club, the Department of Surgery, really appreciate it. Um, and uh, we look forward to reading your next book. And thank you thank for- you. Much. Yeah, I hope I can come back and talk to you guys about Gillies at some point. But thank you so much for your questions and, and your kind words about the book. I really appreciate it. Great. Thanks, everybody. Have Bye. a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.